Have you ever wanted or needed a bag for multi-purpose use or a bag that you don't need to worry about your important items such as your phone or laptop? Then knack bags are the bag for you. Knack bags are your everyday bag for work, travel, and leisure. Knack bags come with a fully padded interior to keep your electronics safe. With its sleek design, organized interior, and professional appearance, it looks great at work or on the street and expands for more capacity when you need it. Get an act bag today and stop worrying about how you look when carrying your life essentials. Use the code GAME and for a life limited time, get a free TSA approved lock with purchase. Just add the TSA lock to your cart with your knack bag of choice and use the code GAME at the checkout to get it for free. This is Game On, discussing the biggest games and all the latest sports news with Johnny Montabano and Hank and Dichter on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. It's showtime, folks. Game on, episode 12 here on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network, presented by Jack. Johnny Montepano, Hank and Dichter. As you can tell, we are both very, very excited. Hank, welcome. How are you? I am fantastic. The New York Rangers are on to the conference finals. First time since 2015, long time coming. And look, I understand we're going to be underdogs against a two-time defending Stanley Cup champion. But you know what? I am just glad that the Rangers even have the opportunity to possibly end the dreams of a three-peat. Johnny, how about yourself, my guy? How's it going? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great, Hank. I, I got to tell you, uh, I was, you know, I, I was nervous. I was excited. Um but I got to tell you, people have to watch the show because I gave some keys to why I thought the Rangers uh, could win the series. And the longer it went, it worked out. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But I- I'm doing wonderful. I mean, we're pretty much playing with house money now down the stretch here with the Rangers. And, you know, it gives us another week to talk about them at least here with the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I'm doing fantastic. And, you know, we've got a lot to get into, Hank, as always. So uh, it's definitely an exciting feeling. And, of course, folks. Uh, you know, we want to hear from you as well. So make sure you follow us along all of our social media pages on Facebook. We're at facebook.com slash game on ETB on Twitter at game on ETB. Also on our Instagram, Instagram account, game on underscore ETB. You can also watch us on YouTube, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. Subscribe to us. You know, so many ways to get aboard. And uh, Hank, I can't wait to jump into it. You know, we've got a lot to get to. We'll get to the playoffs in just a second. We've got the NBA finals, which are getting ready to go this week. Warriors and Celtics. That's going to be a great matchup. We will get into that. Uh, you know, we just got Memorial Day on Monday, and it's usually a good time in the sports world we, with baseball to do a checkpoint. So we're going to look at where the Mets and the Yankees are through the first two months, about the first third of the season. Also, some notes around baseball. So we've got a lot to get to over the course of the show. But Hank, obviously, you know, you've said it. The New York Rangers, they are on to the Eastern Conference Final after an unbelievable series, a comeback series, the resilient, no quit in New York, New York Rangers. And, you know, I was looking at when my mindset, and we'll get to you obviously in just a second here, but I'll just give you my mindset here first, my thoughts about the game on Monday night beforehand. And now as we get set here for the conference final, the longer that this series had was going, I thought the Rangers actually had a better chance. And, Also, the thing was, too, when you look at it, so Igor continuing to be Igor, I don't think that was ever going to be a concern with this series. Um, But your your question marks were going to be special teams, top-line production, and can you win a game in Raleigh? And we had said that on the show last week. I'd said it in my sports minutes that I've been doing, and that all came true. And you've got to love the fact that the Rangers jump out to a two nothing lead early and then they tack on late and made this game seem very, very comfortable. So that was my thoughts going into it. Now that they've come out of it, I feel relieved. I feel like we're still playing with house money here going into the lightning series. And we know we're going to get to that in a moment, but you know, we, we spoke beforehand and now 
moments after this game. What are, what are your uh, thoughts here as uh, now the Rangers are two series down and two to go? So, so I definitely with agree with pretty much everything you said, and I'm actually going to take it a little bit, take it one step further here. Sure. So going into game six, let's fast forward here. Game five was really the only game, in my opinion, that the Rangers like looked absolutely lackluster. They got outshot badly. In fact, I was on record for saying it was probably their worst performance since, ironically, probably game four of the Pittsburgh series. The only difference was if it wasn't for Igor, that one would have also been a blowout. But in any event, going back to the Garden for game six, I pretty much felt if the Rangers were going to win game six, there was no doubt in my mind that they were going to win game seven. And let me explain why. Because as I said, the only game in the series where Carolina really looked like the better team was game five. Other than that, if you really look at the first two, like they were a late goal away from stealing game one. Game two, like other than the empty netter, you only had like one bad shorthanded goal that you give up during a double minor. And then in the two games at the Garden, the Rangers absolutely dominated. And then going up to game six, it was more the same because they it was pretty much inevitable that it was going to go to game seven. And then once I got to game seven, like I just I remember leaving the garden telling everybody all I wanted a chance was a chance at game seven because it meant that the Rangers like had like the possibility of making history. And you know what? They did make history because let's put it this way. You they scored a power play at the beginning. Adam Fox getting that goal was absolutely huge because if you look at the stat the stats like most of them will most of game the winners of game seven usually win when they score first and then when they had that other power play afterwards i believe it was the Kreider tip in that definitely made me feel better but i'll be honest i wasn't completely comfortable after the second period because even as they were up like they were still getting outshot and i was like telling one of my friends like hey you, you can't let Igor like save you every single game and it looked like it could have changed in the second period but then right at the end ryan strome had that goal this coming minutes after they missed another goal to make it th three nothing and that was the moment where i pretty much knew the series was over because for that miss to happen and then for him to like take get that goal after they had removed the back the ronta and had to play the third stringer that was when you knew it was over. And then Chris Kreider getting another one at the beginning of the third was pretty much the dagger. Even though Carolina got a power play later on, it, you knew it wasn't going to make much of a difference. And yeah, it was a dominant game seven, which is something you don't really see very often in the Stanley Cup playoffs. But I am very satisfied. And look, we have another opportunity now. We are going to go up against the two-time defending Stanley Cup champions, the Tampa Bay Lightning. And look, regardless of how this series goes, you can't not be proud of this Rangers team because I don't think a lot of people, you ask a lot of people, you can ask my buddy Brian Attar, you can ask myself included, you can ask pretty much any other Ranger fan. That's me. Nobody will say that they were going to be in the, in the conference finals. At, like at all. In fact, I probably thought that was their ceiling, but you know what? Tampa Bay, if you look at them compared to, to years past, they have some, some pieces that were there a few, like during their runs, but are no longer with the team. So maybe that could be a difference. But with that being said, they're still an obstacle. Andre Vasilevsky is arguably the best goalie in the league. And I, and I would imagine it's probably going to come down to whoever like, does better on special teams and whoever takes advantage of home ice. And guess what? The Rangers have a home ice. So yeah. I'm saying there's a chance, but yeah. For sure. I, and you know, there's one more thing I want to add to that before I let you talk. Yeah. This is the biggest series since 2015. Guess who that series was against the lightning the lightning. Yeah. And wouldn't it be sweet if they could somehow get payback for what, in my opinion, was, the worst loss of the Henrik Lundqvist era and pretty much the end of that run. Yeah. Now we'll get to that in just a second, but I'm looking, I just look, think about this whole series in general and you nailed a couple of points, you know, game one, 
looked like the Rangers were going to get a win out of there, and then Lightning score. I mean, the uh, the Hurricanes score late to tie it up, and they win it in overtime. Almost kind of similar to a game against Pittsburgh uh, in the first round, and then the second game, you know, not really contest, but then the resiliency to come back to the Garden, and then after Game Five, like you said, was probably the worst game, especially when you have that that goal that gets t- uh, overturned on the offsides when the Rangers could have jumped out to a two one lead. That looked after that, and Carolina scores right away, and the game almost feels over after that game and going back to the garden, you know, you know, the Rangers have been resilient all postseason, but I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable going back to the garden, but they go back and not only do they go back, but they dominate game six, Ronta gets pulled and just watching game seven on Monday night, when they jumped out to a two nothing lead, I felt, you know, pretty comfortable, but at the same time, there was part, there was parts of me. I wanted that third, goal i want it to be up three nothing because we've seen two goal leads in the playoffs like it's nothing we even saw in the western conference even though the blues got eliminated they came back from three nothing down against the avalanche to go to overtime and win game five in that series and keep their hopes alive before ultimately losing but the turning point for me in this game and i think you had said it too when ronta gets hurt and they bring in that backup goaltender and also the save that igor makes i think it was either prior or after the third goal was huge. I mean, that's a three goal swing almost right there. And Strom's goal, which I think any goaltender would have had a tough time stopping because it was an unbelievable shot to make it three, nothing. I felt like right then and there, I thought the Rangers had this game in the back and you would have just thought, all right, are they going to coast or are they going to make this very interesting, give up a goal or two and make it interesting late. And no, they, uh, they kept it going. And, you know, you, you hate to see what happened to Ronta because he actually played pretty well and then he gets hurt, unfortunately. And he looked very human in game six. I mean, that, that oh, was I, too. He looked look, so human in game six. That's another reason why I actually felt the Rangers had a good chance going into game seven. Oh, and, I completely agree. I love Ronta. I was a fan. I never, like, lost my love for Ronta even after he left the Rangers. One of my favorite backup goalies. Yeah, he, he to see he, him go out like that. Ab- absolutely. And, you know, it looked almost similar. They were showing on the broadcast last night. It kind of looked similar to the injury that their regular starting goaltender, Anderson, had. Uh, so it was unfortunate there. But, you know, you put that back, that third stringer in, and one of the things the Rangers did right away was with the, with the strong goal was test them right away. Because, you know, you would have hate to see him try and – it was a two-on-one when they got that goal. You would have hate to see him try and pass and be too cute. It was like, you know, this is a third-string guy. That's – you know, sometimes you need some fortunate things on, during some unfortunate situations. You know, the Rangers face a third-string goaltender in, against Pittsburgh. But you know what? That's part of the that's part of the sport. Got to take advantage of it, and the Rangers did. So they move on here to the, um, to the, to the Eastern Conference Final. And, you know, we had spoken two shows ago – I thought it was a I thought it was a bad matchup for the Rangers against the Hurricanes, but they were able to you know beat the keys to the series to me, and they're almost very similar keys to this series of coming against the Lightning, which which starts on Wednesday night. Um, you know, top lines producing. They didn't in the first two games. That was a thing too. The Rangers got nothing out of their top two lines in the first two games, and the Nets started to switch. You know, Mika was scoring constantly. You know, Kreider scored. Strom. Uh, you had the top guys producing. Your special teams were fantastic uh, down the stretch. Igor continued to be Igor. And then ultimately what the Rangers did in game seven was win a game in Raleigh. The Lightning had won 13 games in the postseason in a row to start. Uh, well, not one, but the home team was the winner in the first 13 games that Carolina had played. And in game number 14, that changed. So, that's where we sit right now as we get you set as as June hits and the Rangers and the Lightning meet in the Eastern Conference Final. And, Hank, the one interesting thing that jumps off the bat when I look at this series is it's a quick turnaround for the Rangers playing from Monday night into Wednesday starting it up. The Lightning now have been off for nine, ten days or so after easily getting past the, the Panthers. So there's going to be that rust factor. I, I kind of remember what happened when the Rangers were in the Stanley Cup Finals against the Kings in that they had a long time to rest before they had to take on the Kings. And obviously each series is different, but the first thing that I think about is the rest factor. The Lightning haven't played now since, I want to say it's been well over a week for sure, and the Rangers are going to be playing you know, 48 hours from uh, Game 7. Could that be a factor in this series? I think it could, because if you really look at 
hockey players and the way they're built like if you give them too much rest they can be like rusty hockey players are like forces of habit so that could actually work into the rangers fact in in the rangers benefit i've seen that happen historically for like really many series and yeah you're right the 2014 cup finals is a good example i think the kings definitely came out guns well I wouldn't say they came out guns and plays and they were they were down two nothing and they came back but yeah they'd been used to playing all those game sevens so like you never really had a sense that they were rusty i would so yeah i would agree with your take right there yeah the goaltending matchup is another the last time they played was may 23rd so it'll be nine days since uh they last played against the panthers and got through them pretty easily if you look at that series and the lightning just you know, when you look at their team, Andre Vasilevsky isn't usually the first guy you think about until the postseason because when in the postseason he's been he takes his game up a whole nother notch. But you look at that team, I mean, you're looking at guys well beforehand. You know, Kucherovs, uh, the uh, Stamkos's of the world. You think about a couple other guys, Braden Point. I know he's been hurt, but you think about those kind of guys before you think of Vasilevsky. And Andre's been a whole nother player. So this series could almost be very similar to the Hurricanes in terms of the keys to the game in that, you know, special teams are going to be a big thing. And you have to also remember one thing, too, about the series, and you had said this, the Rangers have home ice advantage to start because they actually do have the home ice because they were the second seed while the Lightning were the three seed in their division. So the Rangers will have home ice as it starts up on Wednesday night. But I, I, I think special teams, it starts with that and production from the top line. So I, I almost think that they're very similar keys to the – hurricane series yeah and um not to mention let me let me give you a few uh stats for you the rangers actually what went three and oh against the lightning believe it or not in the regular season now obviously you got to take that with a grain of salt because one of those games happened against their backup goalie brian elliott that was the last game played in the calendar year of 2021 and another one of those games happened ironically in the first game of the calendar year of 2022 and then of course you had a you had if I'm not mistaken, I think they also played the second to last game before the trade deadline. So the Rangers are actually a different team from when they last played the Lightning. So it'll be interesting to see how everything plays out. And by the way, I want to go back to Shesterkin for a bit because I do have a fun fact for you. The Hank fun fact. We always love him. Go for it. Igor is the first goalie to have two points in a game where his team was facing elimination ever. Not in Rangers history, ever. Yeah, and that was that was amazing too. I mean, he does it all, and he had probably about the same points as Tony D'Angelo, the uh, the villain of that team. Who, as we all we all know his story, he left the Rangers on bad terms, goes to Carolina, and safe to say the Rangers do not regret letting him go. And look, I was, and if I'm being honest with you, before I at the risk of going on a tangent, I also want to mention I was never really that big a fan of him to begin with, but. <laughs> In any event, that's your fun fact. Yeah, and I, I'm going to be very curious to see the goaltending matchup, how this is going to work between Vasilevsky and Igor. Uh, Andre's actually got a – his goals against average this postseason has been 2.22. You know, how are the forwards going to be? You know, Braden Point could also be a big factor here too. Now, he's still hurt, and his status is uncertain, but uh, the Lightning just have they're, – they're very deep. Uh, that's, that's the thing here too. I mean, they could roll out guys – um, but I tell you, I mean, like I said, I think the Rangers are, I don't think there's really is a lot of pressure on them. Like it was, like we said before, you know, against the hurricanes, I felt like they were playing with house money. I think there was pressure against Pittsburgh, but I just felt like they were the much better team against Pittsburgh. But this is just, this is a whole nother test now going against the, going up against the two times Stanley Cup champions. And man, I, I'd like to think with Igor, you always have a chance with the Rangers. That's the thing. I, I can't rule them out. Now, obviously I'm going to make a prediction for you right now. And I don't think the Rangers come out victorious here, but I also don't think this is a short series. I could see this going at least six. I'd be surprised if either team wins this one easily. I actually think the Western conference is more of a quick series ender than the Eastern conference is. And I'll spend a second on that coming up, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this series goes at least six, but Given the experience factor at this point with the Lightning that they've been here twice before, they are the closest thing to a dynasty that we've seen in professional sports 
in a long, long time. Probably have to go back to the New England Patriots in the NFL. Uh, what about yeah. the Warriors? Well, yeah, I mean, Golden State, I mean, see, it, it, the true definition of a dynasty, Golden State would not be that. But they probably be consistent, if anything, and I know we'll get to them too, but mm-hmm. the fact that the Patriots, you know, have won multiples in a row, the Lightning obviously are multiple in a row, they're going for the third straight, which would be remarkable. Um, I, I just think the Lightning are going to come out victorious, I, but I don't think they're going to run away with this series. I think the Rangers will show some more resiliency, but I'm going to take the Lightning in six if I have to make a uh, prediction in the series. Damn it, Johnny. I feel like I'm copying off of you. Like, hey, great, no, great minds think alike, Hank. That's no, that, I hey. listen. I picked before all you guys go nuts on me saying, Oh, Hank went to Hurricanes and Hank's going against the Rangers. I picked Hurricanes in six last time. It worked. I said five. So I will be more than happy to be wrong. In fact, I would rather be wrong and excited than right and kind of upset. So mm-hmm. lightning in six. But would I be shocked if the Rangers somehow found a way to steal this series and win? Absolutely not. They have no pressure compared to the lightning. And yeah, like you said, I guess this is the series where you really do feel like you're playing with house money. But trust me, though, I really would love to get revenge on them from that series in 2015. I'm sorry, I keep bringing that up, but it's it's still painful in my memory. Thank. Hey, we'll, we'll we'll find out. I mean, a quick turnaround for the Rangers. It gets going on Wednesday night when we're here for episode 13. They will be three games in and getting ready for game four, which would be Tuesday, uh, at, in Tampa Bay. So the series for the Rangers, by the way, so it starts up uh, Wednesday, June 1st, and then it goes Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, if necessary, Saturday, Tuesday. So, you know, the way the Rangers have been playing, we could be here in a couple of shows talking about a possible game seven again. And yeah. would we be surprised? I wouldn't be. I mean, the way that the Rangers have been, absolutely, it, 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 it could be. Yeah, absolutely. There's so, never... There is never – you cannot predict the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's, no, it's we, like we the try. hardest of all the playoffs to win. That's why I love it. Now, that being said, though, Hank, I feel a little bit more comfortable in predicting the Western Conference between yes. the Avalanche and the Oilers. And the, the thing to watch in this series has been with Edmonton, how you know they, they score goals. I mean, they are so offensive. I don't know about their goaltender, though, against the Colorado Avalanche. That would be the thing that I would be concerned about. Uh, you know, Mike uh, Smith's got a goals against average against ch- about 2.7. Um, but, you know, some of the ma- the matchup that I love that I want to see in this series is McKinnon con- again, Nathan McKinnon against Connor McDavid. That's going to be, that's going to be an awesome thing to watch out West. But when I look at that series real quick, Colorado to me has been Stanley cup uh, contender since the playoffs started. And they easily got rid of Nashville uh, they, they took care of the Blues. Uh, but I, I think the Avalanche are going to make it to the finals. This, this this appears to look like an Avalanche Lightning Stanley Cup final to me. But as we see, anything's possible. But I love Colorado coming out of the West here. I actually think they take they take it over the Oilers in five. Just because just of how they've been able to take care of business against, like we said, the uh, the Predators and then the, the Blues. Even the resiliency coming back from that Game 5 defeat when they were up 3 to nothing and blew that, that Game 5 to come back and win. Uh, I think they're, they're just so good right now. I'm going to take them in five. I wouldn't be surprised if Edmonton found a way to win a game or two if only because they have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl on that squad. So really anything can happen there, but with that being said, Colorado wins the series easily. I'm sorry, but like the, they have the advantage in goaltender and they are just extremely deep. And look, if I'm being honest with you, this was the team I probably had winning the cup before the season. And I, I got to go with them. Got to roll with the team that's really good. And look, they've been knocking on the door. This might finally be their chance. Yeah, they haven't been, I think, back to the finals since uh, 2002. And then we also remember the – Oh, one, actually. Oh, that's right. The most fam- One of the more famous moments and mm-hmm. great moments in hockey history was when they won the Stanley Cup and, you know, Raymond Bork after 21 years. Yep. 
O2 was the Red Wings, I think, actually. Well, I think that's when they were in the conference final was back in 2000. Yes. Yes. The uh, the Red Wings, but they haven't been to the Stanley Cup since 01 when they won that series. And obviously, we know we remember the great call from Gary Thorne with, uh, with Raymond Bork. And one of the best moments, I'd say, in my lifetime in sports, it, 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 it really goes up at the top just how memorable that was. And the call and the moment and all that stuff, but that's what's great about hockey. You get you get moments like this. It may not be the most popular sport, but they definitely, you know, I've spoken to some people, uh, even down here in South Carolina, and they're not the biggest hockey fans, but they've said to me that they've been into the Stanley Cup playoffs because of how exciting it is and how unpredictable. And we've seen a lot of dramatic moments. It's not like the M- you know the NBA hasn't had a lot of dramatic moments, and I know we'll get to that in just a second. But that's what's great about hockey when the playoffs start. You get people that. Don't watch hockey, don't know a thing about it, but they're entertained. And, you know, that's one thing that they do really, really well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. For we'll, sure. we'll see. We'll celebrate. But, you know, once Wednesday hits, it's it's game on. It's business. And it's our show. But speaking of which, Hank, let's get to the let's get to the NBA finals. They get started on Thursday, Celtics and Warriors. You know, and as wrong as I was, and I'll take a victory lap here. As wrong as I was about the Rangers against the Hurricanes originally, this series I nailed exactly. I said Celtics in seven. They got through in seven. I said Warriors in five over the Mavericks. They got through that. And this is going to be, you know, when you look at it, this matchup's got a lot of storylines to it. You know, you said it, the Warriors uh, with Steph Curry, with Draymond Green, with Steve Kerr, with Klay Thompson, that those guys all trying for another title. And it, it's going to what's going to be an interesting thing is, you know, Against the Celtics, the Celtics have been banged up. You know, that's one of the reasons why I actually do like the Warriors in the series because the Celtics have been rotating different lineups. This is the sixth time that the Warriors have been in the finals in the last eight years, which is crazy to think about. But I think one of the reasons why that it's not crazy is because the core of the Warriors, you know, it starts with Steve Kerr coaching. It starts with Steph Curry. It starts with Draymond Green. It starts with uh, Clay Thompson. And when you look at it, when you look at those guys, uh, you need when you have a dynasty or you have teams that are trying to reap it, it usually starts with a core group of players. And so uh, you start there and then you factor in, you know, uh, Looney, all these other role players, Andrew Wiggins, who seems to be playing like a, the first round overall pick that he was back with Cleveland. And all those guys contributing, that's how you get to this point. Yeah, the Warriors, in my opinion, are – I have been on the Warriors train like you all playoffs. Again, I feel like I'm copying you off a test, but then again, we pretty much watch the same sports every day. So maybe not, but at the same time, you've got Steph, Draymond, Clay, the OG squad. And then of course you have Jordan Poole going up there too. And not to mention a deep bench against the Celtic team that's been knocking on the door to get back to the finals for so long, but is now finally in only their third NBA finals since the ending of the Cold War slash the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. Sorry, I couldn't resist that little pot shot at the Celtics as a Knicks fan. But in any event, yeah, I think they're definitely going to make things interesting for them. However, at the end of the day, as great as Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smart are, they don't quite have the experience that the Warriors have. And in the NBA Finals, experience matters. You have more than enough superstars. So give me Golden State in six. I think you're right. I think experience does matter, but there are a couple of matchups to watch here. First off, we also also mentioned Al Horford, too, how what he's given the, the Celtics this year. When you look at Boston, they've been dealing with injuries in and out with Robert Williams, you know, Marcus Smart. Uh, you've had some COVID things go on with the Celtics as well. But one matchup I'm really interested to watch here is Jason Tatum against Draymond Green. That, that is going to be something. Draymond Green does not really put up the numbers. He's more of the, you know, the guy that doesn't really line up the stat sheet, but his presence on the court, you know, the defense that he can make, we've seen him make some great defensive stops, especially in the Memphis series. So that's going to be a matchup to watch too. And Steph Curry, you know, he really hasn't been, when you look at his teams, you know, he's not taking anything away from him, but is he going to shine? in a way in this series because, you know, you've had, you know, Clay Thompson back and Clay Thompson. It's great to see him back. It looks like he's the clay of old right now. Um, you know, remember the teams that he had with Durant, 
you know, he was dishing the ball a lot. Now, is he going to have um, a big series as well? I agree. I, I think that the experience part does mean something. But I tell you, I we have not had really a lot of dramatic moments in the NBA oh, playoffs. Sorry, I forgot to mention Game Six, Clay. Game Six, Clay. Yep. <laughs> Hank, I'm going to tell you, this to me has a seven game series written all over it. Ooh. I really, I think we're going the distance here, and. The experience part does mean something, but I tell you, the Celtics have a lot of weapons too. I mean, Tatum's been playing out of his mind. Smart. Robert Williams, if he's healthy and he's there, uh, he is such a big factor to them. I think that means something. Al Horford's been great as well. So we're looking at at something. And remember one thing too, size is going to be something to watch here too. The one of the, th- the problems the, the Mavericks had was that was not being able to flex against the Warriors, and I think they can in this series. I, I think the Cel- I think the Celtics have to use that size and show something, and I think they will. I think that will be a factor, and they have more options than the Warriors had. Uh, than, I'm sorry, than the Mavericks had. So factor all that in. I think we're looking at seven. I am going to take the Golden State Warriors though to once again win the NBA championship. But I don't think they're going to have as easy as the road as they've had before. They've had a very favorable situation. The Mavericks were a great matchup for them. Phoenix getting knocked out. I've been on the Warriors bandwagon since the postseason started, even though a lot of people were telling me about the Suns. I thought the Warriors were still the better team. And I think they are going to pull this off. But I I think we're looking at seven in this series. I really do. Hey, I wouldn't – that wouldn't surprise me. I think the Celtics, if anything, I would say the Celtics were probably the toughest possible matchup for the Golden State Warriors. However, with that being said, I still, you're not really going to slip sway me over to the seventh because I still, at the end of the day, think the Warriors not only have the experience, but the home field, the home court advantage is going to be a big factor. I think they're going to at least take one at Bo- uh, TD Garden. Sorry, I keep calling it Boston Garden, even though that place is long yeah. gone. But you know what I mean? So yeah, dubs and six. You said it too. Home court advantage. I think the home field, home court, home ice, whatever you want to say, the home advantage means more in the NBA than in any other sport. And the Warriors are undefeated at the Chase Center this postseason. And all it takes those for the Celtics to win one there, and then they get the advantage. But I just I think the Warriors just have a little bit too much. They have that experience factor. But I tell you, the Celtics are going to give them a, t- a tough battle. And I and I agree. If this was Heat Warriors, I think Golden State would win it in five. I, I think they'd match up so much better against Miami than Boston. But Boston's just got so much. They do have some ways to exploit the Warriors. But I just think Golden State's got a little bit too much to deal with as well. For sure. For sure. Yeah, I probably would have also called the gentleman sweep if the Warriors had played the Heat. Yeah, no. I mean, the, the Celtics have had a, have a, had a, t- a tougher track to this point. You know, in years past, the West would be a tougher trek to get to the finals than the East, but it seems like the roles have been reversed. So if you remember, you look at the Eastern Conference, you know, you've had to get past, you know, the Nets who were still, you know, the Nets were the two seed. You have to remember that. You know, the Nets oh, – I'm sorry, not the Nets. But they were the ones that, uh, you know, were talked about as maybe making a deep run. You know, the, you, had the, you had the Milwaukee Bucks with Giannis. Uh, they had a favorable situation there because – Giannis had to do it all by himself. He couldn't get – Middleton was out, and they couldn't get a, a Drew Holiday or Grayson Allen to step up like they did against the Bulls. So their trek to the to the finals has been probably a little bit more challenging than the Warriors. So you could use that also as another reason why the Celtics – and, you know, Tatum's been great. Smart's been unbelievable defensively as well. So it's not going to be – I'd be surprised if this series ends quick. I, I think we're looking at at least – you know, six or, or I just think it's got seven written all over. I think we're looking at actually an instant classic here for an NBA postseason that's been anything but classic. Are you ready for another fun fact? Sure. This is the first time the Celtics have played the Warriors in an NBA Finals since 1964. Wow. Yeah. I. I mean, that was. Pro- I want to say that was like right after they moved to California too, because for those who don't know, they originally started off as the Philadelphia Warriors. Yeah. It's that's that's certainly been that certainly uh, looks like it. Wow, but 
Yeah, I'm I'm excited for this. You know, I'm not excited for the late start times. <laughs> Sorry, call me uh, call me old, whatever you want. I mean, it's given my situation, but uh, it's I, I think we're looking at an instant classic here. I really I really do. So we'll we'll find out. They get going on Thursday, and they uh they seem to go like every three days. This series probably will be three weeks long when you when you look at it from start to finish. But I think we're looking at a classic. Uh, Finals matchup that maybe we'll be talking about for a, uh, a while as the Warriors are in there in the Eastern Con- in the NBA Finals for the sixth time in the last eight years. The Celtics finally getting over that hump in the Eastern Conference to make it to the back to the finals, and we'll find out because you got a lot of great got a lot of great matchups, got a lot of great talented players. This is what the NBA wants. They needed something like this after the kind of postseason that they had, and you know hopefully we'll have we won't have any. Uh, injuries or any COVID problems with these two teams as the playoffs, as the NBA finals get going on Thursday night. Uh, Hank, you know, when, as we turn the calendar to June, it's always a good, this is a good time to take a look at major league baseball. I feel like once you get through Mm -hmm. Memorial day, that's like where you want to see where your team is at through the first two months, first third of the season. And our two local teams, the Yankees and the Mets, boy, I tell you, I didn't think they'd be this good. I thought they'd be up there, but they've been remarkable. And let's start here with the Yanks first. We'll start there. And, you know, they got through. They just finished, wrapped up a series with the Rays where they split the series after winning the first two, tough last two losses. We had documented on the show last week about Chad Green and Luis Heal being out for the season, but the injury bug has started to hit the Yanks, though, in a big way with, whether it's been with multiple relievers or, you know, now Stanton being out Donaldson who was on the COVID list and then ended up going onto the injured list. He's got shoulder inflammation. So the injury bug starts to uh, hit the Yanks after they were a pretty healthy team for the first six, seven weeks of the season. But first third of the season, I I, I think you've got to be absolutely pleased with what the Yanks have been able to accomplish so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we were on record we said 13 and 10 was what we wanted the Yankees to go during the 23 games, 22 day stretch. Am I correct? I, I think you were signed up for that. Absolutely. 16 and seven. Yeah. I'll take that. I'll take I, that any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Although sure. granted, I didn't like seeing them lose the last two games at the circus tent, but you know what? I will, if you, if you told me they would have split before that series started, I would have probably accepted that regardless of how the last two games ended. And, yeah, no, there's nothing I really am enjoying where the Yankees are. And this is going to be a fun series coming up. The Angels coming to Yankee Stadium. Do you realize it's been four years since we've seen a Mike Trout versus Aaron Judge series? Because one of them, one or both of them, haven't been healthy at the same time every time that's happened. Yeah, that's I absolutely could believe it's been that long for sure. And they're both playing unbelievably well. Trout's, you know, it's great to see him back out and healthy. Judge putting up an MVP kind of season as he heads towards free agency after this year. So it, that's that's an amazing thing. And it's going to be fun to watch, you know, Otani being there. You know, I think it was, what was it, last year that they were playing and the Yanks knocked around Otani for seven runs in not even an inning. Uh, unfortunately, they lost that game. It was one of the worst games of the season. Uh, but – yeah, it's going to be fun. And, you know, this is going to be a good test for the Yanks coming up here with the Angels coming up. Now the fact that their lineup is going to take a hit now with both Stanton and Donaldson both being out. But the one thing you've noticed with the Yanks recently, too, is their pitching has held up. You know, the rotation's been excellent. You know, they they gave them a chance to win all four of those games in Tampa. It's just their offense got shut down, and that's been – Something I, I was concerned about going into the season is I thought this this offense was going to be very streaky. And you notice how hot they were to start and how much they've cooled down a little bit. And that goes to speak to the fact that with Stant and Donaldson both being out, you're going to be flexing other guys in there. And, you know, of course, you know, everybody's favorite targets, Aaron Hicks and Joey Gallo. That's, that's it. You know, here it is now. We're entering June and Joey Gallo's got seven RBI. Yeah, no, those were the two guys that I think, unfortunately, as much as I know you've been a defender of Hicks, but I'm I'm slowly starting to really get tired of seeing him come up with runners in scoring position because, like, look, I know, I know he's done some decent things, but he just feels like an automatic out. And with Joey Gallo, like, 
at least I can live with Joey Gallo because you know he has the potential to hit the ball out of the stadium. But still, there's also a reason why I was never a big fan of that trade to begin with. But at the same time, you also have to remember with all the injuries and COVID list guys that we have, like you pretty much have to rely on them, which isn't the best position to be in. So hopefully they can find a way to like swing a trade at the deadline to maybe improve the lineup depth. But still, though, can't really complain about the Yankees at this point, not with all the injuries and not with the fact that you went 16 and seven on a brutally long stretch of games. Yeah, and you got a little scared there with LeMahieu, too. And it's good to see that he's back out there because that that would be something where I'd start to really get concerned about because part of the reason for the Yankees' success is you've had a healthy LeMahieu at the top. And Glaber Torres, now that he's finally got a natural position, his natural position, and he's got seems to get his power swing back. I mean, I think he's got as many home runs, if not more, than he did all last year already. Uh, he might be healthy now that he's more comfortable suited back into that position. To me, the Yankee season, offensively at least, boiled down to two key guys, and that was a healthy LeMahieu and and Torres. Because then everybody else, you know, just comes naturally. You know, Judge and Stan are doing what they're doing. Um, you know, Rizzo's been good. And Donaldson, when he was out there, was all right. But, you know, the concern you had with Donaldson was his age. And that's starting to show itself now at 36. And Stanton, one of the things with the roster construction, though, was that you knew Stan was going to have to play more of the outfield. And it was weird because they originally had said it was a quad strain. Then they said it was an ankle injury, which was kind of weird. But these things are going to come up. Look, everybody's going through these things. I mean, I've never seen as many pitchers go down like I have this year. But I think, unfortunately, that speaks back to you know, the shortened uh, spring training because of the lockout, and you're starting to see it where it's ugly, ugly head. But I think you've got to be happy here with the Yanks where they are. Uh, they're going to be streaky. You know, they're going to – right now we're talking about them being, you know, streaky with the uh, injuries that they've had. Uh, this is going to happen. But they're going to have moments where they'll heat up offensively again. And like I said, you know, you have to like what this pitching rotation has been. You know, Garrett Cole's back. Nestor Cortez is unbelievable what he's doing. I mean, he almost threw a complete game against the Rays – on Thursday night. So did Tyon the next day. Yeah, and that to me, you know, if Tyon is going to be like, the, if he's going to give you these these kind of starts, then I tell you, I mean, this this team, at least from a, a, for the most part, is going to look pretty good. You know, Severino's pitched all right. Uh, Montgomery's probably been their most consistent pitcher when you look at it, but he just hasn't got much run support this year. There's always going to be that one guy. But if this rotation is going to be like this, then – I, you can live with the streaky offense because the pitching will give you a chance to win. I'm almost a little bit more concerned about the bullpen situation because now, you know, Chapman's out. Uh, Loisica is out. Uh, Chad Green's out. So that's three guys right there that were key guys to your bullpen that are going to be out. You know, obviously Green for possibly two seasons, a year or two. Uh, you know, Loisica. Another shoulder problem like he did at the end of last year. But the crazy thing is Chapman being out too. But then, you know, Michael King steps up and he's pitches like one of the best relievers in baseball, even though he's had a little bit of a struggle. And Clay Holmes, you, you insert into that closer's role and he's been lights out. So you put guys in different roles and they step in and they do just fine. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the bullpen's definitely been – it's been up and down over the past few years, but I think that's another – area that's definitely been a strength for the Yankees over the years and including this year. So hopefully we get to see it keep going and yeah. Can I just say one thing though, before we switch gears here, because a lot of of talk on social media about this with the situation with how poor Aaron Hicks has been and Joey Gallo, Brett Gardner is not a lifesaver for the Yankees. No, he's not. I mean, we have, we have to, we have to stop from that. Now, if you're going to tell me that we're going to have two season-ending injuries in the outfield, then you could, then that's fine. But Brett Gardner, why? I understand. Look, lifelong Yankee, it's great, all that stuff. He's he's going to come in here. He's going to be very similar to Aaron Hicks. The only difference is he's not playing on a seven-year in the middle of a seven-year contract. You know, he, listen. He, I love Guardy as much as the next guy, but I I agree at that. This point, there comes a time where you have to move on from and from somebody, even if he even if it means a Yankee legend. Just ask Don Mattingly and Derek Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I just I, look. The team's in first place. They are 
winning in an unbelievable clip right now. I mean, they're on pace to win 100-plus games this year and actually win the AL East, unlike years past. And, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about making the change right now. I, yes, will they go out there and get another guy? I think for sure there's going to be – this will not be the same team that you see in August and September. But it's going to be all right. You know, I could live – with Hicks right now, and I, I'm going to defend him for a little bit longer. Look, if you get to the August 2nd trade deadline and he's still doing this kind of stuff, then we can talk. You know, Joey Gallo, I, I've been on record of saying I didn't want Gallo, Stan, and Judge all on the same team entering this season. But now they're going to be very important players with Stan being out for hope. I mean, they're saying hopefully just a minimum stint, but still, I mean, he's out for a little bit. So everything's going to be all right. Live with them. It's okay. It's not the end of the world here. You would have thought you would think Aaron Hicks is making thirty million dollars this year with how they talk about him. This is a guy that hasn't played a full season in years, and it, it you could live with it. It's fine. Yeah. Or or Jacoby Ellsbury for that matter. Take your pick. Oh, I, I'll take Aaron. I will take Aaron Hicks over Jacoby Ellsbury. Contract yeah. wise, because if you remember at the time. They signed Aaron Hicks at the time. They thought it was a great move signing him early. Yeah, for it seemed like seven it. years, seventy million to not worry about having to pay him twenty million dollars a year, like they did with Ellsbury. I think the Yanks were learning their lesson. They did that with Severino too. It's just unfortunate that both of them would undergo significant injuries over the course of time. But they were trying to lock up all of the young guys, uh, young and early. It made sense at the time. Yeah, sure. yeah that's worked out. But it's not like Aaron Hicks is making twenty to thirty million dollars per season. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think right now you got to be very happy with the Yanks at 33 and 15 as we uh, get ready to turn the calendar to June. Yeah. Angels matchup is going to be uh, amazing to watch. And as we head closer to the deadline, yeah, I think they'll make some moves. But if this rotation, I, the one thing I take out of it too is the yeah. rotation's just been consistent. If they, um, <coughs> if the, uh, if yeah. their rotation, that's okay. You're good. If the Yankees rotation, you know, continues to be like this and their bullpen, you know, continues to pitch lights out like it has. Uh, there's some guys that still concern you, despite the injuries too. If they're like this, then you're going to live with this streaky lineup, and you'll be all right. I mean, this is, yep. this is really shaping up to actually be a pretty good season for the Yanks, and I, I still thought they'd be up there. I didn't think they'd be this great, but I also thought there were going to be moments where they're going to be very, very streaky, and we've seen that now in kind of both directions. So, I still say watch out for the Rays and the Jays, though. They're both going to be very tough outs, and. The Red Sox, regardless of their pitching rotation, I know they've started to get hot lately. I know they're still not above 500 yet, but they're not that far out of a wild card spot. So I would say watch out for one or one or all three of them. I still find it amazing when you look at Tampa and just the kind of players that they have out there, and they're still able to do this. It's just mm-hmm. it's remarkable. And the thing is, too, say one of those three teams that you had mentioned, the Rays, the Jays, or the Red Sox, do fall out of it. They still have the kind of team that come August and September, if you're battling for a critical spot, whether it's the division or the wild card, they're gonna they're gonna give you a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. And even the Orioles, I have to say, the Orioles are not as bad as they've been in years past. They're not a, 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 a gimme. I mean, we've seen that obviously last year with the Yanks, and even this year, you know, the Orioles have had a couple of walk offs. They had a couple of comebacks, I and mean, we we've seen them actually dominate against some teams at times this year too. So the Orioles are not going to be a gimme either. So this mm-hmm. whole division is that's another if you want to really boil it down, watch the the in division matchups as the season continues here with the Yanks. And it'll be that'll be something to keep an eye on, especially if it comes down to possibly tiebreakers if it comes to really be that close later in the season. Yeah, and you know, I think we also have to talk about that other team in New York cuz they even with all their injuries they are still the only team that has a lead in first place of more than five games. Absolutely. The, what the New York Mets are doing right now is incredible. And we had said last week, we were talking about with Max Scherzer going down and people thinking it's the end of the world. And I said that it's really not because this team is just different this year. And you've seen that this past week, especially uh, even the game, you know, I pinpoint last night, I pinpoint to Sunday, their ability to come back. Yeah, look, they have a couple of tough losses out there in San Francisco, but they come back in the game against San Francisco. Even the game they lost 13 to 12, they scored eight runs in the eighth inning. Ultimately, they blew that game twice, but they still have the ability to come back from the dead 
And even when they had a terrible game that uh, Wednesday afternoon, that getaway game with that uh, AAA pitcher, and they get nine runs in the first two innings, the ability to come back and sweep the Phillies, to come back the way they did on Sunday Night Baseball uh, with Nick Plummer, who they had to call up, uh, and he hit a home run in the ninth inning to tie it, and then they went in the tenth, and then even against the Nationals to – be down three nothing early on. You know they give three. Run, Peterson gives up three runs early on, and I was checking in while watching the Ranger game, and then they come back right back to the bottom of the first with two runs, and then before you blink, it's six three nine three twelve three. Good night. I mean, and Nick Plummer again another another home run. So this is incredible what the Mets are doing, and they're going to slump at some point, but you have to love what this team's giving you. Pete Alonso, Francisco Lindor. Those two guys right there, I mean, that's the team really there. And, you know, Marte's been, been helping out. McNeil's the McNeil of old. You know, Nimmo gets on base. Even Eduardo Escobar, who's, ha- who's not had the best of seasons so far for the Mets, he gives you a wall- he gives you a great catch in the uh, Sunday night game, and then he wins it in the bottom of the 10th. Buck Showalter, I'm telling you, the manager is making such a big difference on this team. Buck Showalter, the best thing the Mets ever did was getting a legitimate, capable manager in here because that's why I think this team, can, while they will slump at some point, are going to contend for, at the bare minimum, a wild card spot this year. Yeah, no, I pretty much agree with that. I still think the Braves are going to be a threat to them for the division, but when you look at how the lineup as a whole has performed compared to last year. I think that'll make a big difference. And there's a lot of teams in the national league that are pretty much going to are pretty much gimme wins. So like, I think the Mets definitely should be in it, but ultimately I'm still not sure if this is a world series team, but I got, I got to give him credit where credit is due. And Buck Showalter, as as you said, was the right guy for this job. We knew that all along. You're talking about the, uh, the, the lineup. And I think that's one of the big reasons why, that the Mets, I think, are going to are different this year. When the Mets were, you know, they had also a great start last year before they ultimately tanked. But one of the things they were relying solely on pitching, and while they are missing three of their guys in the rotation right now, this lineup is so much better than in years past. I mean, it's so well balanced. It's you know, it's powerful with you know Alonzo with with Francisco Lindor who seems to be bouncing back. I mean, you have to. Very quietly, Francisco Lindor is on pace to have an over 100 RBI season. So, I, I think you have to. I think that's something that, that can't go unnoticed. Yeah, and, for sure. Especially when you look at how he was the first year. And I'll give you this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you this too. There are only two teams above the Mets in terms of run differential for the season so far. Which ones? The Yankees and the Dodgers. Well, that makes sense. The Mets run differential there at plus 62. In fact, they, they were second in, in the National League in terms of runs scored. And uh, actually, yeah, they're second in baseball in terms of runs scored. It, with 256, only the Dodgers have scored more when you look at it. So, I mean, they've had games where they've scored. You know, last night they scored 13. They scored uh, 12 in San Francisco. I mean, they, they, put up, they put up runs, and they do it – you know, they do it the way that old-time baseball used to be. You know, they have guys that get on base, and then they have guys that drive them in, and you've got some mm-hmm. power with Alonzo, obviously. I, they don't, they're not the power kind of team. They actually will, will get on base and then drive guys in. We saw that even last night against the Nationals. It's it's truly remarkable. I mean, the fact that you get three runs in the top of the first and you don't feel like you're out of it because they, they storm right back. It, it, it's it's amazing. It, it really is the amazing Mets. I mean, they, they really are. I and then I was going to get to this too. When you look at baseball, the Braves to me, I know they've been, they've done this last year too, but the Braves to me have been a big disappointment so far. And I was oh, watching, wow. yeah, I mean, I was watching one of their games when I was out Saturday, and they happened to be on the TV, and I'm noticing like I know Acuna came back; he was out for the first month or so, but you know, Matt Olson has not yet been that kind of impact guy that we thought he was going to be there in Atlanta yet, but. At some point, the Braves are going to are going to heat up. I know they've had some injuries to their bullpen and stuff, but I think the Braves at some point will get things going. But the rest of that division, I have been so wrong on the Phillies this year. I, I mean, if you remember when we did our baseball preview show, I had the Phillies as an over at 85 and a half. Now, of course, I didn't think that was going to be how terrible they would be defensively. And part of that problem, too, is 
Bryce Harper it can only DH right now. He cannot play the outfield. So what that's forcing them to do is that's forcing them to stick Kyle Schwarber out there. That's sticking Nick Castellanos in right field. And it's it's a tough watch. We saw that and we saw them throwing the ball away in the Mets series over the weekend. Uh this team defensively, I mean, they are they are not good defensively. Uh, that's been a big, big problem for them. I thought they're offensively. They had the potential to be one of the best teams in baseball, and that's that has been a big miss on my part so far. Yeah, no, that's what happens when you don't have a reliable pitching staff, and that's also what happens when you have a team that, in my opinion, isn't really fundamentally sound. I mean, if they're defensively, if defensively they're not among the best, but they have guys that rely on the home run, that's kind of a recipe to disaster, and it's not like I'm unfamiliar with the team that did that a year ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Hank, we know you're a big. We know you 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 host a baseball show, hitting for the cycle, which mm-hmm. folks check that out Thursdays at 7 p.m. over on our with our buddies over at Review and Preview Sports. When you look around baseball right now, what's stuck out to you so far, team or league wise or whatnot, at, through about the first third of the season? Well, I think one team that's really stuck out to me, like standings wise i would say the los angeles dodgers i mean look i know they lost one to the pirates but that's still a team that's pretty much where we expected and mookie Betts, i think you can already make the case that he is the mvp i know he had a rough start to the season but he had a two home run game he's got like a 330 batting average and then 15 home runs that that guy is absolutely unstoppable and then really the whole nl west division like I didn't think the Padres were going to have a chance after the Fernando Tatis injury but they're they're finding their way hanging in there they've got a much better manager 30 and 18 and then even the Giants not too far behind I knew they'd be in the mix as well so the NL West definitely is something that's been very intriguing and I would also have to say that the Milwaukee Brewers are an X factor for the NL Central I think Look, their only real competition is the St. Louis Cardinals. I mean, look at the look at the crap that's at the bottom of that division. So, and the Cardinals, you know how experienced they are. You know, you know what they can be. But Milwaukee, I think, if their hitting improves and is better than where it was last year, I think they, I think they have a great chance of possibly upsetting the Dodgers in the playoffs. But we'll see. Yeah, I, I'll I'll give you that. Dodgers to me, not a surprise. Uh, Padres, a bit of a surprise. I didn't think they'd be this good, especially with Tatis being out. And Tatis is starting to take the next steps to returning. And if you get him back and he gives you anything, I mean, it's almost like making a trade uh, deadline acquisition. It's uh, It's been like that. But the Cardinals, they always seem to find a way. You said, it, you know, they've, they've had injury problems and that they get guys that come step up. They come up and they, they produce right away. I'd say, like I've said, I – I think the Braves, to me, are a disappointment. I think the Phillies are a disappointment. Uh, when I look out west, a team that I was high on and they have been hit by an inj- the injury bug big time has been the D- Detroit Tigers. Uh, I had them actually as an over. They're 18-29. and 29. They've had a bunch of problems. In fact, they actually just brought up uh, Cody Clemens, the uh, son of Roger Clemens, uh, to Ooh. team. They've been bringing up guys because they've had a, a, a lot of problems. Uh, but – I'd say, you know, you look at this, you look in the standings in general, and like I said, the Orioles to me, you know, they're 21 and 29. We were thinking that they were going to be, and they might still end up being a terrible team this year record-wise, but they've been actually been able to give teams fits this year. So that just goes to speak whole the hill, the whole AL East in general, how it's not really going to be a pushover while it's going to be, a, it's going to be a challenging division if it's going to be real close as the season progresses. But um, the White Sox, too, are another one. Injury problems throughout, and they've been affected by that. So as much as I want to say they're disappointed, that's been a reason why, too. So the White Sox being off to a slow start. So injuries have been a thing, some surprises along the way, but I like the fact that our two locals are relevant. Uh, it's going to give us something to talk about, about throughout the summer as uh, now we count down also the football season. We're less than 100 days away now from the return of football. So we've got, uh, you know, we've got relevant football coming up. We've got uh, baseball, which has been relevant. We've got the Rangers. You know, this is a fun time. I have to say, when we started this show thir- uh, 12 shows ago, I didn't know what we were going to be, if we were going to have a ton to discuss. We've had one almost every show. And this now is helping as well with the Yankees and the Mets being 
really, really relevant. Now, still, though, I have to say we are a third of the way through the season in baseball. There's still part of me, though, Hank, that just thinks about the lockout and how it's affected this game. Mm -hmm. And, yep, yep. you see where I was going with that. I still think about good old Rob Manfred. It it, it just – it's because of the whole Apple TV stuff. It's because of Peacock Sunday morning baseball. By the way, how's your Sunday going to be this this week? You've got Tigers, Yankees, and Sunday morning leading into Rangers Lightning at 3 p.m. Maybe I wake up early, go to the Bronx, and then find a way to watch the Rangers either at home or at a bar somewhere. I don't know. I, you know, I know a lot of people that are not really a big fan of the Sunday morning baseball. I think it's kind of cool in some ways. If you, te- uh, I think, well, this week it shapes up well for the Yanks since they're playing early and then the Rangers play at three o'clock. But the whole Sunday morning bit, the Amazon deal, the Amazon package. I was looking forward to watching the Yankee game for Friday until I realized that it's on Amazon. I couldn't watch it, even though I have it. I'm not going out of my way to watch uh, a game, even though I think streaming, I mean, you look at more and more, I think it's going to be inevitable. It's going to be taking over even in sports. We are seeing, we're going to see in a football this year. There's already a, one of the London games is on is exclusive to ESPN plus we know, about the Amazon Thursday night package, but I think it's different with football uh, being a national sport versus a localized thing in baseball. But uh, yeah, good old Rob Manfred. I, I, he, you know, he's still, you go throughout the season, you try and get entertained, and then you see things that just remind you about, you know, what the problems with the sports are, what the sport is, and what how it's going to continue. Yep, I pretty much agree. Still haven't quite been able to get the bitter taste of the lockout out of my mouth. But you know what? The Yankees starting off well eases that blow a little bit. So And the Mets, yep. Both, yep I'll they, take that. They, 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 do, they do help. I mean, and just what, what you've seen – out of them this year and you know whenever one or both of the new york teams do well ratings go up ratings go up and yep absolutely and it gives you stuff to talk about uh, that is for sure it's going i think we're in for a good summer this year with them and with the new york sports scene in general absolutely but uh yeah so that's uh that's just about and one other thing real quick before we get out of here i don't know how much interest you have also but the match the golf thing with the with the uh with the NFL, the NFL players with Rogers and Brady, and I think who else is playing there? Breeze. It happens, I believe, tomorrow night. Something, you know, Pat Mahomes is going to be there. Uh, you know, I'll put it on for a few minutes. I mean, they, I know it's for charity and stuff, but uh, you know, you've got the old golf match. But yeah, well, and we'll find out. And you know, we still are waiting to hear news on the NFL front about Deshaun Watson. Uh, it's been kind of a quiet scene in the NFL the last couple of weeks. And, you know, it's almost like their little break. You know, you couldn't keep up the crazy offseason that they had. But before you know, that'll be here. In fact, in like two months, you'll have some preseason games. But, uh, yeah, it's it's an exciting scene. It's Brady, Rodgers, Josh Allen, Pat Mahomes. That is it, as uh, Nick tells us behind the scenes. And, Nick, thank you, as always. And also, real quick, a quick programming more note, empty the bench is going to be moving to Wednesdays. That is starting this week. So a little back-to-back sports action here on the Empty the Bench podcast network. You've got us Tuesdays at 3 p.m. You've now got Empty the Bench starting this week, Wednesdays at 3 p.m. So check that out with our buddies Tom, Nick, and Nick. It's going to be a great show coming up. Them, I believe that's episode 137 that's starting for them uh, this week on Wednesday. And, of course, folks, if you miss any part of Game On, you can always uh, – Watch us back on our YouTube channel on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. So if you want to watch the show over again, catch some moments, that's how you do it. You know, subscribe, hit that little red button, and uh, you'll find out when we're coming back on. And, of course, on our social media channels as well. So, Hank, as they say, let's go Rangers. The third round, wave that wave that rally towel. That's, uh, that's the way to do it. It's worked throughout, and we'll see if it does again here in the Eastern Conference Final. Of course, NBA Finals, uh, baseball, we got all that stuff covered for you. And we'll be back next Tuesday for episode number 13, a lucky one of Game On here on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network.